Amen. Thank you, Jesus. All right, well, good evening. I want to welcome everyone to the service again, both those that are here in the room as well as those that are streaming with us online. We're glad that you're here with us to worship Jesus. All right, so tonight we have part 14 of History of Modern Israel. So this is... Uh, Again, gone for, for quite a while. Um, if you remember when we were last talking, we had just finished the Yom Kippur War. Um, and so uh, this is kind of starting from the aftermath of that, specifically around um, Egypt and uh, Lebanon. So we'll start with uh, Egypt. So uh, Anwar Sadat, who was the, uh, the president of Egypt, he's the one that basically started you know, the Yom Kippur War. And, uh, you know, he actually had success in the very beginning because, you know, they uh, knew Israel wasn't going to preemptively strike them. So they uh, were able to bring more of their forces up and they crossed the Suez Canal. And uh, that made him basically a hero in the Arab world. And so he was known, you know, as the hero of the crossing. And so he had a lot of... Uh, favor, a lot of stuff in the Arab League, because he actually uh, was able to make a dent into Israel before he, they pushed him back across the Suez, and of course, you know, from the last time we spoke. Um, but he, after the Yom Kippur War, really started changing, you know, a lot of things. He, he uh, started making uh, more reforms in Egypt. He was uh, really trying to uh, boost their economy, uh, get things more about what the people needed. And he saw that there was uh, quite a difference there, too. Um, or he started making a difference. And he, he gained popularity in Egypt uh, further because of that. Uh, he did reopen the Suez Canal, and then he did the unthinkable at the time. He started uh, saying he wanted to develop a peace policy with Israel. And that took a lot of the uh, things of what he was known as as a hero to the Arab world before, and that kind of started chipping away at that. Uh, but it was still popular for a lot of the Egyptians because, you know, no longer do they have a leader that was just willingly, you know, sacrificing them to put, you know, dents in, in uh, Israel or to take out some Israelis. But you had actually someone trying to, to help them. And so he had two agreements uh, that was signed in 1974 and 1975, where Israel would start to pull out from uh, Sinai. And then in uh, November of 1977, he became the first Arab leader to officially visit Israel. And uh, Israel invited him, and he spoke in the Neset, and uh, spoke there how to achieve uh, peace. Uh, later, uh, they met at Israel or met with Israel at Camp David uh, with uh, at the time President Jimmy Carter, and they signed an official peace treaty. And uh, he won a Nobel Prize or Nobel Peace Prize for his actions too. And uh, there was a lot of you know talk at the time. You know, I guess all you have to do is be belligerent to the, you know your neighbor for a while, attack them unjustly, and then declare peace, and you get it. But you got to realize, though, when you look at where he was at, and the power that he had, you know, for him to turn from that way and to change it with all the pressure that he had on from the Arab League, because the Arab League kicked Egypt out for, over this. You know, and he lost all of his basically standing with the other international Arab communities uh, because of this. Um, and so, you know, you think about it, that was a huge, huge step for him to do. And so he did win the Nobel Peace Prize, and part of his uh, speech uh, that he gave upon accepting it was he said, let us put an end to wars. Let us reshape life on the solid basis of equity and truth. And it is this call which reflected the will of the Egyptian people, of the great majority of the Arab and Israeli peoples, and indeed millions of men, women, and children around the world that you are today honoring. And these hundreds of millions will judge to what extent every responsible leader in the Middle East has responded to the hopes of mankind. 
And so even with there, he was reflecting, you know, that it's really about the people wanting that, that peace process. So again, he was uh, uh, popular with a lot of the Egyptians that were there that could uh, do the reforms and all that. But he was very unpopular with the radical Islamists. And uh, they had uh, uh, put out, you know, the assassination things on him. And they successfully assassinated him on October 6th of uh, 1981. Uh, coincidentally, was during the victory parade of that of the crossing of the Suez. Uh, they were indiscriminate because they just went in there. They killed uh, 12 people and wounded uh, 28 others. Uh, and uh, then there was the funeral. And the funeral was at the time for world leader uh, had a record number of foreign di dignitaries that attended, including three former uh, U.S. presidents. The Israeli uh, prime minister uh, attended his funeral as well, but only one Arab leader uh, decided to attend, which was uh, Sudan's uh, president. And so it really shows there, too, you know, again, how far he went, you know, toward, uh, you know, doing the peace process and how much he was uh, shunned, you know, by the Arab world for doing that. In the meantime, the, uh, the PLO you know, was operating before when Egypt, you know, started doing the peace. You know, they couldn't operate in Sinai. Of course, Israel was occupying uh, Gaza and the West Bank at that time. Uh, Jordan had already uh, kicked out the PLO because they didn't like the activities and how, you know, Egypt had started them and, you know, still had all the activities that they were doing coming out of Jordan. So Jordan uh, did not appreciate or like the PLO. They were kicked out. So, uh, Syria, you know, was up above. They had had the war, the Yom Kippur War, and they had the UN peacekeepers all throughout uh, the Golan Heights, which was the only place of the border. So the only place left to go for the PLO that still bordered Israel was Lebanon. And so PLO had basically relocated to Lebanon. They uh, specifically are on the southern area, just north of Israel in that Galilee area. And uh, the Lebanese government was not strong enough, really, to repel them. And they had a lot of, you know, support by other Arabs, you know, and stuff in that area. But Lebanon was a very multicultural um, uh, nation, even at that time. Um, they had a, a majority Muslim uh, um, population. A lot of that came from when uh, Israel was founded and they had the uh, mass exodus, exodus and all the refugees. Over 100,000 of the Palestinians had relocated up into Lebanon from before. And so there was a lot there, but there was also healthy uh, Christian uh, cities and organizations there. And uh, the PLO came in there and basically just run roughshod over uh, anybody that was giving them resistance. They uh, took over a lot of the churches and used it for stockpiling their weapons and uh, for storage and all that. And so they started operating out of there and uh, launching their attacks on Israel from Lebanon. And this went on for, for quite a while with Israel you know, responding and trying to put a stop to it. Um, and then it just it kept escalating. There was a time where there was a ceasefire that was uh, organized but it didn't last at all. And then the 11 months uh, that's listed there, the PLO launched 270 different terrorist attacks on Israeli citizens, causing uh, 29 deaths and 300 plus injuries all around there. And so there was still all this activity. There wasn't peace that was uh, being hoped for at the time. And that Lebanon civil war had kept going, you know, uh, for a number of years, um, you know, and so a lot of people, a lot of the citizens even left, uh, left the whole country at the time. But that started really the first Lebanon war with from Israel. And it started when the PLO tried to assassinate uh, the Israeli ambassador to the United Kingdom. They were, uh, they were successful in shooting him, but he uh, survived even with some permanent uh, injuries. Um, but, you know, that was kind of the, the final straw on that. And so Israel launched war into uh, Lebanon to try to take out the PLO. Uh, Syria, who was probably the nation that was most anti-Israel at the time, 
Uh, you know, they couldn't really attack because, again, they had the UN peacekeepers there, but they were supplying arms and logistics into the PLO, uh, into Lebanon, and trying to uh, control the area that way, too. Um, the thing with Israel, though, is because it wasn't uh, fighting against really the the country, they were really trying to go after you know the PLO, the ones that were doing the terrorist attacks. There really wasn't a clear objectives you know that was identified at the beginning of it. They're like, we're not going to take over Beirut, but that's when PLO started going more toward that, and then they wound up going in there and surrounding you know the city and doing all that. So it was changing uh, each time. And the PLO knew that they couldn't really get into Israel and to attack. And so their strategy was really about discrediting Israel and trying to change world opinion that was going on because world opinion had started shifting more toward Israel based on the other wars and stuff, especially with Yom Kippur since they didn't you know, attack first and were defending. But this one, they would get into places where, um, you know, there were civilians. They would attack there and then move, you know, and they would hide behind civilian targets. They would hide behind uh, places that, you know, were like hospitals or other places they'd put their weapons. And, uh, and they put this real campaign out there uh, trying to discredit. So they would talk to news agencies and talk about how Israel had blown up this and there was no PLO there. And uh, the news agencies would run with the story and just start talking about, you know, how could Israel do this against no military targets? And Israel is like, no, there were military targets. So Israel started sharing with the news medias the actual reconnaissance photographs and what their things were actually doing. And it turned more into a war about, you know, what was uh, the thought process, you know, and, uh, you know, about world opinion rather than just what was right in there, too. Um, and so, you know, that's where the national news agencies played into, you know, that because it put up their uh, ratings and all the rest. That, that stuff was happening way, way back in the 80s, too. The United States had gotten involved, you know, in Lebanon as well. They had sent, uh, you know, Marines there that were supposed to just be, you know, peacekeeping forces and trying you know, they wouldn't attack, but try to keep peace in there. And um, and then they were uh, bombed. They had uh, suicide bombers come in, and it killed about 240 Marines and stuff there. And so they, they decided to pull out from there, too. There was a lot of hostages that were taken, uh, even of Americans there. That's where the whole Iran-Contra uh, thing you probably heard about, you know, with the U.S. supplying arms to Iran to try to get hostages released there. Um, but the Reagan, Ronald Reagan, uh, developed uh, what was called the Reagan Plan because he really wanted to try to get the peace process uh, going over there and uh, build back up Lebanon, get the PLO out of there, uh, which you know they eventually did. Um, but you know after after a while, long time, and Reagan, uh, his thing was really back to that calling for land for peace. You know, an establishment of the uh, uh, of Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza. You know, if they could show that they could do that over five years and and govern on their own and and do the security and peace uh, about it, um, but it was not well received by really either side. Uh, the Israeli Prime Minister uh, stated it's the saddest day of his life because it's basically giving recognition to a terrorist organization you know, instead of, you know, the, what the people were. And all the stuff that was done before, they have gotten many, many times over. Uh, it was like five different times that c there could have been a Palestinian state if they would have gone to the negotiation table. But it was always that, you know, Israel was there. And that was the point they couldn't get over. Uh, even here, Yasser Arafat um, was stating that, you know, there will be a Palestinian state with the capital of Jerusalem, which... Sounds fine until he starts adding, and there will not be any Israeli citizen or soldier anywhere near it. And so it really shows, you know, it's like they're not really in for the establishment of it. Just like when he's in Lebanon, uh, you know, doesn't care about the citizens there. He just wants his objective. He wasn't caring about the Palestinian citizens. He just, again, wanted, wanted his, uh, his objective there. So, again, the PLL op opposed the plan. 
uh, because it validated the existence of Israel. And that's where we're going to end for tonight.